planned it, uh, you know, a year ago, but we were forced to do it. And guess what? It works. Uh, employers it works, yeah. and employees are finding that, hey, it works. You can communicate and get stuff done. And maybe it's, there's some attractions to it. So this work from home thing is here to stay. Uh, what yeah. companies will do, they'll say, well, instead of 10 floors, I only need two floors and I'll have attractive offices but they'll, you'll reserve them. You'll call up and say, hey, I need an office two days next week to meet some clients. Done, they'll build locker rooms. They won't be like high school locker rooms. They'll be very attractive. <laughs> you'll keep your laptop and your sweater and your scarf or whatever in your locker. You'll show up, take your stuff out of your locker. Some receptionist will tell you which office is yours for those two days. Set yourself up, meet your clients, go home and work from home. What does that mean? If you cut uh, commercial real estate capacity or utilization by 80%, uh, we'll start with the cleaning crew and the reception, but what about the food trucks, the restaurants, the shopping, the public transportation, uh, drinks after work, um, you know, on and on and on. All the things that are ancillary to that downtown office location, you cut that by 50 to 80 percent. What is that doing to your economy? So these are examples. And by the way, this will take a year to play out. This is not an overnight thing. Uh, so uh, the tenants are not paying rent. If they are, they've called up and negotiated a 50% increase. There's, I'm, I'm, I have some involvement in commercial real estate and I, I see this in real time. So rents are down by perhaps half or all the way to zero if they're not paying. And everyone says, well, you know, landlords are rich. No, they're not. The landlords take the rents, but they have mortgages. So if the tenants aren't paying the landlords, the landlords can't pay the mortgagee uh, and that falls on the banks right? Uh, except the banks are clever. They've securitized it and sold it probably to, to you and me, right? Looking your, look, we have our 401ks, like a superannuation fund, but you look in the fund and do you have some, uh, you know, a commercial real estate uh, REIT or something that Morgan Stanley sold you? Well, maybe you do. And what's inside? No one knows, but take a look. Um, so, but that ripple effect I just described can take a year to play out. So we haven't seen the end of this. So the bottom line on all this is that interest rates are going up in anticipation of inflation based on handouts. The reality is the handouts are not being spent, they're being saved, which does nothing for inflation. And it's also not sustainable, which is what are you gonna do? Hand out a $2 trillion deficit spending package every six months? Because that's kind of what we've been doing since last summer. And they keep saying, well, this is the last one, it'll be sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's a handout and people need the money but if they put it in the bank, which they're doing, this is a classic liquidity trap. So what's going to happen? Yeah. But meanwhile, meanwhile, the interest rates are going up, perhaps for the wrong reason, but they're going up. That's going to slow the economy further. We're already seeing mortgage applications dry up. Uh, we're seeing the housing bubble, not bubble, but pretty steep increase in, the, in residential housing starting to level up. So by, um, you know, hard to say, but I would say by March or April, this whole thing is going to go in reverse. Everything we just talked about is going to go in reverse. The economy is not going to have the traction. Unemployment is going to remain high. Velocity is going to continue to drop. There's not going to be any inflation. Those interest rates are headwind. They're going to drop and the price of gold is going to shoot up. So my advice to uh, the potential gold investors is uh, it's on sale. Uh, go get some right now. Uh, it's always better to buy low and sell high. And uh, <laughs> but I would expect the price to be much higher by mid-year. I know that you've said this before, or I'm pretty sure you've said this before, that to stimulate an economy, you need to reduce interest rates by somewhere around three, four percent to have an effect. When interest rates are currently at zero, how can you do that? Where do you go from zero? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the, the short answer is you can't. You, 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 in theory, you can go to negative rates, but negative rates don't work. We have experience from um, uh, the ECB, uh, Sweden, Japan, Switzerland, and elsewhere that negative rates don't work. They're, they're negative rates, but they don't, it's not more of the same. Cutting rates from 3% to you know zero has a beneficial effect, but cutting them from zero to negative one, now you're through the looking glass. You don't get any more pop. You don't get any more bang for the buck. And there are reasons for that, which are what, as a central bank, what signal are you sending? Well, see, the idea of negative rates is you're going to spend the money because if I'm going to take it away, you put money in the bank, even at zero, you put money in the bank, you go away for a year, come back, the same amount of money should be there. That's the zero interest rate. But a negative interest rate, negative 1%, you put $100,000 in the bank, you go away for a year, you come back, you only have $99,000. Because I took $1,000, that's 1% negative interest. So the idea is that I'm going to take your money, you're going to spend it fast because you don't want me to take your money. Uh, and that's going to have the stimulative effect that we talked about. 
That's not actually what happens. What happens, two things. Number one, uh, people have lifetime goals. Um, their retirement, their health care, their parents' health care, their children's education, buying a house. There's some large lifetime goal you have, and that's why you save money in the first place. If I'm taking your money away, you're going to save more, not less. You, you, still, you still want to achieve that goal. I've made it more difficult, but you're actually going to save more. They want you to spend it, but now you're saving more. And the second thing is, what signal is a central bank sending when they have negative interest rates? Mm. They're saying that they're worried about deflation, not inflation, mm. but deflation. Yeah. So if they're telling me, if central bank is telling me that deflation is a problem, I'm going to wait. And why should I buy anything right now? Wait till the price drops. Um, and by the way, a negative interest rate, negative 1%, my example, is a nominal uh, phenomena. But in real terms, if you have deflation, my money is worth more. So even though my dollar amount may be less, my purchasing power went up because prices went down. And so negative, that's why negative interest rates don't work because A, you're sending a deflation mm -hmm. signal. So people defer spending and B, they have lifetime goals. So they actually save more. So negative rates don't work. So you see, so you're right. You're stuck at zero. There you are. I mean, you can do QE, you can do quantitative easing. Um, and usually what happens is they hand the ball over. I don't know if it's a rugby match or whatever, but they, they hand the ball from monetary policy, which is now impotent, to fiscal policy, which is deficit spending. Uh, but there you have you have other kinds of headwinds having to do with very high, um, very high debt levels. More to the point, uh, in terms of you know what a what a central bank can actually do, they they can stimulate. They they can print money, uh, and governments can spend money and incur deficit spending. But again, none of it does any good if uh, if people don't actually spend it. And that's a psychological phenomenon. And the Fed or the Reserve Bank of Australia uh, or any central bank can print money, uh, no doubt about it. But they can't change people's psychology. You need, we had an external shock, an exogenous shock in the form of the pandemic that caused people to stop spending, save more, or they were unemployed. Or you know, if you're the unemployed individual, you're, you're not taking your friends out for dinner these days. Uh, you're putting money in the bank. And even if you still have your job, um, you're going to save money because you're worried you might be next. You might be the next one to get laid off or your company might shut down next week or next month. And so you're going to save more. It's what economists call precautionary savings or, you know, in plain English, saving for a rainy day. Um, and that's what's going on. It's going on, going on uh, all over the world. Modern monetary theory, MMT, first of all, it's well over 100 years old, maybe 140 years old. Okay. So there's nothing... There's nothing uh, particularly modern about it. It goes by another name, uh, chartalism, uh, but it's the same thing. Um, money is what the state says it is. If the state says it's money, it's money. I think, okay, interesting. How do you actually enforce that? How do you back that up? And the way you back it up is taxation. So if you make, we all make money, you know, gains, you know, payments, uh, income, whatever, and the state says you've got to pay tax on it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we will only accept our, our definition of money in the form of taxes. So if you don't go along with our definition of money, you can't pay your taxes. And if you can't pay your taxes, you end up in jail. But the idea is that money is what the state says it is because the state says that's the only thing we take in the form of taxes. If you don't pay your taxes, we'll put you in jail. Now, and, and that's where chartalism comes from because you know, the king's charter or the queen's charter or whatever. You know. So, so if, if that's your starting place, then there's no comparison between a national budget an individual budget. If you and I don't pay our bills, you know, someone's going to, you know, repossess the car or, mm -hmm. you know, take take the keys to the house or whatever. Um, so we got to balance our budgets over some time frame. But if the government doesn't pay its bills, so what? Just print some more money, and uh, or raise money in the form of bonds. Um, and then you say, well, what if they what if they don't want to buy the bonds? You know, what if the market doesn't want to buy the bonds and the interest rates are well? That's what central banks are for. The central bank will buy the bonds, keep the rates low. Oh, yeah, but who's going to pay the central bank? Well, we'll just issue more. Now, I, I realize this, some of this sounds laughable, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm telling you verbatim, this is what modern monetary theory is. Um, so there's no limit on how much you can spend, no limit on the size of your deficit. Danielle referred to the debt to GDP ratio. I agree, that's a very important economic indicator, but the, uh, the modern monetary theorists will say, no, it's not. Doesn't Who matter. cares? Yeah. Um, yeah. U.S. debt to GDP ratio is uh, about 130%, but it's growing quickly. Um, and if you look at global statistics and say, well, who's at that lunch table? Like, who else is around 130%? The answer is Lebanon, you know, Greece, mm -hmm. Italy. These are your classmates. But then everyone points to Japan. 
where the ratio of Japan is about 280%. I say, see, Japan, the, you go to the Ginza, the lights are still on. Yeah. Uh, so we could go to 280% or whatever, no problem. I think Japan's a special case for a number of reasons, and I wouldn't want to be Japan. Um, they have a, the, they're in a curious position where the population is declining. So their per capita numbers are actually better than their gross numbers. And uh, uh, Saki Kaparasan, you know, famous Mr. Yan of the 1980s, he explained this to me personally. I had lunch with him in uh, Korea. Uh, and of course, he's right mathematically. I said, but the, the reductio ad absurdum is you, you know, Japan ends up with one person who owns the whole country and she's very rich. But that's, that's kind of how the Japanese are thinking about right. it. So I don't know if we want to, if we want to go there. Uh, but just to take it a step further, and a lot of this comes from uh, uh, Stephanie Kelton, and I met Stephanie, very nice person, uh, but she's this way off on, uh, uh, you know, off the reservation, so to speak, in terms of these theories, but she's done a good job of articulating them. So, for example, she says, and this is from her book, so this is not my, you know, I'm not imposing this uh, on her. She says that the, the government bond market is a favor to investors. We're doing you a favor by giving you something you can invest in. We don't actually need a government bond market because we could just give the Fed wire instructions to Lockheed. And if we want to buy a new you know, fighter aircraft or Raytheon or uh, whoever is providing services to the government or the Social Security Administration for that matter, the Fed could just wire the money directly to these government vendors. Who needs a bond market? It's kind of an inefficient pain in the neck. Um, but we do it anyway because we get, we need, you guys need a place to park your money. I mean, this is what they say. Wow. Um, and so, uh, now, but just to kind of step back a little bit, big picture, what they're doing, and this is, uh, this can be done in practice. See, the problem with refuting modern, modern monetary theory is you get very far down the road saying, yeah, that's actually true, that's actually true, that's actually true. At the end, it all falls down. But they go very far down a path because <clears throat> the truth is you could give the Fed wire instructions and they yeah. could send money to Lockheed. They, you know, you could issue twice as much debt. I mean, there's, there are no, there's a, there's a debt ceiling, but Congress routinely raises it. Uh, but what, what she's done and what the other theorists have done, they've taken the Treasury, which is a cabinet level executive branch office, and the Fed, which is, you know, an independent, privately owned, you know, okay, the government, president picks the governors, but, you know, mm -hmm. technically privately owned, independent agency, and she's merged them. She's merged the balance sheet of the Treasury and the Fed, said whatever the Treasury wants to spend, the Fed is there to finance it, mm -hmm. the Fed can buy the bonds, and we can skip the bonds completely and just give the Fed wire structures and send the money out. Now, this is what they say, this is not me. So, um, and then you say, well, okay, um, I don't see what's wrong with that. I mean, it sounds, you know, legally, I'm a lawyer also, yeah. this is all true. It can be done in practice. I guess that's my point, regardless of the legalities. So uh, where, does it, uh, where does it all fall down? A couple of things. Number one, the, the theorists completely ignore the role of commercial banks. They're so focused on the Fed and the Treasury. Real money, the money that counts, is created by commercial banks, not by the Fed. <clears throat> Pardon me, the Fed, when they create base money, that's available to banks as reserves, mm -hmm. but there's no shortage of reserves right now. They're, they're paying interest on excess reserves. Right. Most of the Fed's balance sheet is, is not cash, it's excess reserves. So there's no constraint on banks' ability to lend or borrowers' ability to borrow money and spend. That, that can be constrained by reserves in theory, but it's not because they have uh, trillions in excess reserves. Okay. So, so that's not even an issue, but the, um, uh, you know, but the money's created at the banks. If people don't want to borrow and banks don't want to lend, then the M2 and M, uh, M1 and M2 don't expand. And then velocity, which is the turnover of money, is collapsing. It's up a little bit recently, but that's after a, you know, a Red Bull cliff dive uh, in 2020. Um, and that's, you know, I always, always say if, if you have $24 trillion uh, and, you know, times zero is zero. Right. Meaning if, you, if that's your money supply and your velocity is zero, you don't have an economy. So velocity is psychological, the Fed can't control it. Um, <clears throat> there are all kinds of behavioral aspects. Um, this, the, the real money that kind of creates economic activity doesn't come from the Fed, it comes from the commercial banks. They ignore the commercial banks, and then on top of everything else, <clears throat> they ignore foreign exchange channels. You can destroy the dollar, like everything inside the United States can kind of look okay, but if the dollar is like, you know, it's, it's, it's worth, you know, uh, five euros, or, or sorry, five dollars to the euro, so, you know, it's worth, uh, 20% of what it is now, um, or, uh, you know, every, every other currency strengthens against uh, the dollar, or gold goes to $4,000 an ounce almost overnight. 
what you've done, you've, de you've de devalued the dollar 80, 90%, which is what we did in the 70s. Mm -hmm. it measured in gold, you go from $35 an ounce to $800 an ounce. That's a 90% devaluation of the dollar measured in gold. And that, and we actually had a 50% devaluation of the dollar between 77 and 81 measured by CPI. So this has happened before, not yeah. that long ago. So they're, they're on a path to destroy the dollar. They're on a path to destroy the international monetary system. Here we are in Bretton Woods where it all, all began, but, uh, you know, the governments may be back here trying to fix right. things <laughs> sooner than later. So, um, now I doubt there are five members of Congress who could give you a tenth of what I just said about modern monetary theory. Right. But they all, they're doing it. Whether they know it or not, whether they understand it, it can define it or not, it doesn't matter. They're doing it. These multi-trillion dollar year after year deficits, debt to GDP going past 130%, um, unlimited bond and issuance, monetization by the Fed or the commercial banks, uh, they're, they're playing it out. So this, this will end in uh, uh, something a lot worse than a recession. The U.S. is heading into a recession, and we may be in a recession. Everyone's like, wait a second. <laughs> Yesterday, GDP was up 5%, and it was. That was the number for, for the, uh, the, it was the first government estimate for the third quarter of uh, 2023. It was up 5%, but it was very heavy on consumption and very heavy on inventory. When uh, wholesalers and distributors build up inventory, that counts as GDP. Well, it's fine to build up inventory if people are buying the stuff, but if they don't buy the stuff and you're up to the rafters in inventory, you got to start writing it down. This is where you see, you know, you go to the Gap and you get like 10 shirts and five pairs of jeans for 30 bucks. I mean, the inventory situation comes down to the consumer. Are people buying stuff? It looks like the consumer hit the brakes in August. Now, the second quarter is July, August, September. Sometime around mid to late August, after two pretty strong months, and they were strong, um, the, the, the consumers just hit the brakes. Now, they had done enough to make the third quarter strong, but going into the fourth quarter, they may just you know, not show up for the game. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is during the pandemic, you go back to 2020, 2021, what was going on? Well, starting with Trump in, uh, I think, June 2020, he gave everybody a $1,400 check. If, if you got a heartbeat, you got a check. And then Trump did it again in December 20, uh, 2020, sorry, um, just before he left office, it was another $600 check. Biden comes in and says, well, I can top that. And Biden does in uh, February or uh, in February 2021, right after he was sworn in, here comes another $1,600 check. And then when people got those checks, they saved a lot of it. So what happened in 2023? People drew down their savings. They, the savings rate got really low. Like they spent the savings they had, they didn't make new savings. And then they turned to the credit cards and ran up their credit card balances. Well, that feels good for a while, but then if you're paying the minimum, uh, and rolling over the balance and you're at your limit, your credit limit's used up and the interest rates are 20%, some of, are, some of them are 28%, you're gonna double that balance in three years. Uh, so if you're like, oh, I'll just pay the minimum this month and I'll figure it out, your balance is going up because the interest is compounding faster than you're paying it down at 25, you know, 20, 25%. So um, people are tapped down on the credit cards, they've used up their savings, they, um, they're getting into a deeper hole because the interest is compounding faster than they can pay off the credit cards. Uh, and they're just back and it's showing up in things like gasoline consumption. It's way down. The demand for gasoline is what economists call inelastic, meaning you just have to buy it no matter what the price is. You got to take the kids to school or get to work or go shut, whatever it is. You're just going to buy the gasoline, even if you don't like the price. By the way, lately prices have been coming down a little bit, which is another that sounds good, but it's actually a bad sign because it's disinflationary, which kind of leans in the direction of a uh, recession. But um, for gasoline consumption to drop, forgetting about the price, that means people are not driving. They're not going on vacation. They're not doing road trips. They're not driving any more than they have to. There are a lot of other signs. We don't have time to get into all the all the technicals with the you know negative uh, swap spreads and uh, inverted yield curves and, and all the rest. But uh, it does look like the consumer slammed on the brakes around late August, early September. The fourth quarter could be a disaster. The stock market's starting to wake up to that fact. So I would say it's a pretty simple uh, recommendation map. Reduce your exposure to stocks overall. Increase your exposure to cash. It'll give you, uh, you won't lose money on cash, um, assuming that inflation is not bad. And it'll give you a lot of optionality. You know, you can go 
if things get really, really, really bad, if you have cash, you can go shopping and find some bargains. But uh, if you're in stocks and they go bad, you're just going to lose that money and never see it again. Um, and uh, but if you if you do have a, if you do have stocks or some stocks, I would look at uh, energy defense, um, not, not for good reasons, there's enough wars going on, but defense will do well and mining because, uh, um, you know, gold and silver prices and strategic minerals will do well. So defense, mining and um, uh, energy are the sectors I'd be in. I'd, I'd lighten up on tech, get out of everything else go to cash. Uh, treasury notes look attractive here because interest rates are going to start to come down there. I know they've been going up. I get it. But it looks like they've peaked and have turned around. So treasury notes, a good two-year note, a five-year note will perform very well. And they're very safe, obviously. Um, and uh, and just take it from there. But you've got to be You've got to be tuned into the geopolitics to understand the stock market. You can treat them as separate subjects, but if the world's falling apart, so I, that's not good for stocks. Right. So when we say bond markets, Matt, we have to be careful which bond market. I'm talking about the U.S. Treasury bond market. Um, you know, the short-term short treasuries, you know, four-month bills, six-month bills, up to one year. The funny thing now is that the highest yields in the U.S. Treasury market are in like a six-month bill. Like, wait a second, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't I get more if I buy a 30 year bond or shouldn't I get more if I buy a 10 year note? Um, it's a longer maturity, more stuff can happen, inflation, bank freezes, all those things can happen. I want a higher interest rate for my longer term security. That's usually the way the yield curve looks. It's kind of goes, it's upward sloping. The longer the maturity, the higher the rate. That's not true today. The highest maturities are right around um, six month bills, one year bills going out to two year notes. When you get to the 10 year note, um, you actually get a lower interest rate, lower what's called yield to maturity than you do on a two year note. The interesting thing about two years is you get a high rate, uh, but it's less volatile than a 10 year note. Uh, it's more liquid. Uh, I mean, 10 year notes are pretty liquid, but, but two year notes are very liquid. Um, so you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can have a shorter maturity, which means less risk in some ways and a higher interest rate. So it's like, like I say, the best of both worlds, but the highest interest rate is actually from six months to one year. So those are very, very safe security securities and they're paying like five and a quarter, you know, uh, not quite five and a half, but you know, well, between five and a quarter and five and a half percent for six months, for a six month treasury bill. Why wouldn't you just buy one of those? I mean, it's more than what you get in the bank. Now, the answer is, um, well, yeah, Jim, that sounds good. But if interest rates go up even more, you're going to lose money on, on your capital. The, the value of the note or bond will go down if interest rates go up. That's that's bond math 101. You know, rates go up, prices go down. The opposite is true. Rates go down, prices go up. So you can make or lose money. But that inverse relationship kind of throws a lot of people. But that's just how it works. So, yeah, buying a two-year note that yields about 5.1%. Very liquid, very safe, uh, good return, more than your bank will pay you, more than most stocks will pay you. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? Well, the answer is, if you think the two-year note is going to go to 6%, you might not like it because you're going to, you know, if you hold it for two years, you'll get your money back. But if you want to sell in the meantime, you're going to lose, you're going to have a capital loss on the note itself. So, so therefore, the next level of analysis is, well, what's going to happen to interest rates? Everybody wants to know that. Um, in my view, they've peaked. Um, they're going to come down. Uh, and if you like that action, you might prefer the 10 year note because uh, a longer maturity has a higher, you know, not to get too technical, it's called DBO one dollar value, one basis point. And what it means is that, so interest rates come down a certain amount, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points or whatever. And I said, bond prices go up, which they do, but how much do they go up? Well, the answer is the longer the maturity, the more they go up, they're more volatile. And so um, to your notes, a really attractive piece of paper, very safe, you get your money back, uh, liquid, you can get out of it, et cetera. You know, the only reason not to buy would be if you thought rates are gonna go up. I don't, I think they're coming down from here on out. But uh, if you accept that view, then the 10 year note is gonna have the biggest capital gains. Now, again, it's riskier. When I say risky, I'm talking about market risk. I'm not talking about credit risk. You are gonna get your money back but from, a, but from a market risk point of view, if you had to sell it, you know, a year from now or six months from now, for that matter, uh, if rates go up, you're going to lose a little money on the um, on the value of the note itself. But uh, but if rates come down, 
not only do you get the 5% interest rate, which is sweet, but you're going to have a capital gain on the note because that's what happens when rates come down. So the big question is, have rates peaked? And I would say they have. And I base that on what I said earlier about the economy. If we're going into a recession, we're going into a slowdown. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risk. Stocks are coming down. Then interest rates are going to come down too. The debt's not going up at 2% or 3%. The debt's going up 8, 9, 10% or, or more. The U.S. had a $1 trillion baseline budget deficit, a trillion dollars per year deficit for fiscal 2020 pre-pandemic. The Congress threw $3 trillion of emergency aid on top of that. And I'm not even criticizing all those programs. I mean, the, the payroll protection plan loans, the extended unemployment benefits, the increased unemployment benefits. Imagine where we'd be if we hadn't done that. But that aside, debt is debt. They piled $3 trillion on top. Now, this is going to take the U.S. debt to GDP ratio up to 135%. It was 106% when Donald Trump was sworn in. It's close to 130% today. Because remember, you got two things going on. It's a de debt to GDP. So debt's your numerator and GDP is your denominator, right? Well, what happened? Well, the, the denominator shrank. This got smaller and this got bigger. So what happens to the ratio? It blows up. So now it's 135%. If you get the laws of economics right, which is not easy because most economists don't, yeah. but if you get if you get them right, um, it's really a reflection of, of human nature. I mean, what is an economy other than all the people in the economy starting businesses, buying, selling, traveling, providing goods and services, et cetera. So um, human nature doesn't change, at least it hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years. So the fundamental laws of economics don't change either, uh, but circumstances change, facts change, and that's important. Now, to answer your question, Curry, um, you're right. There is um, a school of thought, uh, a growing one, an influential one, that the debt doesn't matter. It's like, well, wait a second. Um, so what? So the G debt to GDP ratio went to 135%, which it did. Who cares? Well, what's wrong with it? 180%. We got issues. We got problems. Print up the money and monetize the debt and uh, spend it and uh, keep going. What what is the problem? Uh, this this comes under the banner of something called modern monetary theory, MMT. Uh, it's flawed. It's wrong. But it's it's got its followers and those followers are now in the White House because um, one of the things Joe Biden had to do to get elected was to make peace with the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party. They take the view that if the Treasury didn't spend the money, how would anybody make any money? That's ridiculous, but that's what they say. They say, hey, when the Treasury spends money, what do they do? Well, they they um, build aircraft. They have uh, benefit programs. They have government contracts. They do whatever they do. But when the Treasury gives you the money, you take the money and you spend it on somebody else, goods and services, go out to dinner, have subcontractors, whatever it might be, that that's the, the real source of money. They also take the Treasury and the Fed and they merge them. Now, that's not legally the case. The Treasury and the Fed are separate institutions. The Treasury is just part of the executive branch uh, and the Fed is an independent agency. Uh, and the Federal Reserve Banks are actually privately owned. Uh, that a lot of people know. Some people know that, some people don't. But the, the Federal Reserve Banks are privately owned by banks in the districts, so Citibank, Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, so they're completely separate. But, but the theorists ignore that and say, no, uh, the Treasury needs to spend money because that's how the economy grows. And the Fed can monetize the debt. So you spend the money you don't have. You borrow to cover it. You issue bonds to cover the borrowing. And if the market wants to buy the bonds, fine. But if not, the Fed can buy them and put them away on the balance sheet, wait 30 years and collect the money. What's the problem? Who cares about the debt to GDP ratio? It's kind of a statistical abstract, but why should that stand in the way of using money to solve our problems, which are free health care, free child care, free tuition, um, forgiveness of student loans. That's a 1.2 Oh, sorry, $1.6 trillion ticket, by the way. And look, everyday readers and investors, there's no reason they should know all this stuff. This is this is total inside baseball. You have to be a geek like me to kind of keep up with it, but, uh, but it's all coming. But what that means uh, is we're going to test the Rogoff Reinhardt thesis. Now, let me just take a minute to explain, my, explain that. Up to a certain debt to GDP ratio, 
there is a uh, Keynesian multiplier greater than one. So the classic example is the UK was in a depression before the rest of the world. They have been hit pretty hard uh, before the Wall Street crash. People aren't spending, they're saving. It's the liquidity trap. So if you get money, you pay it on debt, but you don't have any debt, you put it in the bank. Whatever you do, you don't spend it. You you hoard cash or people were buying gold. They were accused of hoarding gold, etc. But what they weren't doing was spending. And there was a lack of aggregate demand and the banks were not lending. So um, so Keynes said, well, if, the, if people, if, if everyday people won't do it, the government must. The government can borrow, the government can spend. And what they discovered was that if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you can get a dollar fifty of GDP. Uh, now, there's a separate debate as to whether that's actually incremental or whether you're just pulling growth forward. But so what? Even if you are pulling growth forward, maybe that's what you need to do when you're in a liquidity trap. Um, but there's a problem. He called it uh, the general theory, you know, general theory of uh, um, employment, interest, and money. Um, but it was actually a special theory. I think he had a little Einstein on me because of the general theory of relativity, but um, it's actually a special theory, which means it's a theory that works in a set of circumstances, a set of conditions. The conditions where it works are you're either in a recession or just coming out of one. You have excess capacity and uh, 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 labor and uh, uh, industrial capacity, and you have very little debt. In those circumstances, you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get more than a dollar GDP. The problem is that extra GD, that extra GDP you get for the borrowing spend, it goes down as the debt to GDP ratio goes up. What Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered is that at 90%, you go through the looking glass. Your payoff is now less than a dollar. You borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you only get 90 cents of GDP or 95 cents, et cetera. So now, not only are you not getting your dollar's worth for the borrowed dollar or something more, which you did at lower levels, you're getting less than a dollar. So now what's happening? You're borrowing a dollar, you're spending a dollar, you're not getting a dollar of GDP, but you are getting a dollar of debt, which means your debt to GDP ratio is going up and the 90% is getting worse. And I just mentioned we're, the United States is at 135%. So here are your two competing schools. There's the Keynesian multiplier and creating aggregate demand with government debt and the Reinhard Rogoff, more than a thesis, I would say powerful evidence that beyond 90%, it doesn't work. It goes under less than one on the one hand. And my friend Stephanie Kelton and Bernie Sanders and Kamala Harris and the modern monetary theorists who say, no, it's all good. How could you get growth if you didn't spend money through the government? These theories don't agree at all. Mm. We're going to find out which ones work. I, 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 I'll, I'll give it. I'll give away the answer, which is that uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have it right. Keynes had it right up to a point. Reinhardt and Rogoff discovered that critical threshold that whether you want to call it tipping point or phase transition, or which physicists call it or whatever. The modern monetary theorists think the opposite, and we're going to find out. But what? But what it means if Reinhardt and Rogoff are right, and I'm right, and Keynes was right. The more you borrow, it's actually a headwind of growth. Now you get le just as up to the threshold, you got more and more and more. Oh, sorry, it, 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 at a low level, you got more, but then it went down. But it's like any uh, diminishing marginal return. You know, the, the curve starts very steeply, you get a lot of payoff, then it flattens out, then it goes down, but it's still positive. But at some point, it goes below the zero line and your marginal return is negative. And that's where we are. People, they said, look, we understand that Chinese are communists and they're kind of bad actors and they do bad things. But if they're willing to embrace something that looks a little bit like capitalism, they will grow richer. Uh, they will grow more sophisticated. The education level will go up. We will accommodate that by letting them join the World Trade Organization and the IMF, even though we know they lie to you still, because they will eventually get rich enough that they will be just like us. They'll throw off their communist masters embrace the Western model, and it'll be just like Europe. We're, we're all on the same team, democratic, you know, quasi-socialist, but democratic, capitalist, liberal, in quotation marks, societies, and China will be just like us. That was the theory. I said it was wrong at the time, and time has proved that correct, meaning they're just rich communists. I said the only thing worse than a poor communist is a rich communist. And so we have created rich communists at the expense of our own workers, at the expense of our own economies, 
They are not like us. They're more communists than ever. Communists, atheists, uh, the human rights violations are you know, incalculable. They, if you're a Uyghur, uh, maybe a Muslim Uyghur, or a Catholic in China, and you express any dissent at all, you will be arrested, you'll be put in a concentration camp, indoctrinated with communist philosophy. Maybe you'll get it, maybe you'll fake it, maybe you won't. But for those who apparently don't get it, they're strapped to an operating table without anesthetic and their organs are removed while they're still alive and sold to the organ uh, tourism industry, this huge multi-billion dollar transplant industry in China, and then they cremate the bodies. That's real. And what does that sound like? You know, killing innocent people and cremating the bodies? And um, we've we seen that movie before. So that's who, you, I don't know why we do business with China at all. So that's who you're dealing with. They're not getting more like us. They've elevated Xi to, uh, first of all, president for life. There used to be this, you got two, two five-year terms. And then in your second term, you appointed, uh, you kind of announced or anointed your successor who would then pick up the reins at the end of your second five-year term. That process was, uh, which is driven by consensus, was working very well and giving China a little bit of stability. Xi tore it up. He's in a second five-year term now, but he did not announce a successor. And they, at the last National Party Congress, they changed the rules so that um, he can stay on indefinitely. So he's president for life. Uh, they also created something called Xi Thought, which is a big deal because it elevates his uh, ideological musings to the level of Mao Thought. He's only the second uh, Chinese leader to get that designation. All the others, you know, okay, you're president of China, head of the Communist Party, whatever, but they were never treated on a par with Mao. Xi is. So we have Xi Thought. Uh, we have, you know, gross human rights violations, geopolitical confrontation, near war in the South China Sea, um, you know, testing the boundaries with India, all the, you know, intellectual property theft, lie, cheat, steal through the economy. Their numbers are fake, by the way. I'm sure you've heard of something called Goodhart's Law. Goodhart's Law says, when a metric becomes the object of policy, it loses meaning as a metric. So in other words, if you compute your GDP honestly, it's valuable information. It tells you what your economy is doing. But the minute you target GDP as a matter of policy, it loses meaning because you're just manipulating to a result. That's what they're doing. And this is a big deal because U.S. companies are watching this now. Apple's the, I guess the although the Chinese value added in the iPhone is about 6 or 7%. A hundred percent of the cost of an iPhone is treated as a Chinese export and a U.S. import but their value added is only about 7%, give or take, because they buy the, you know, the, the Gorilla Glass they buy from uh, Germany, uh, the um, circuits they buy from Japan, uh, they buy other components from South Korea, so they have to pay as much as they get, and then they're just assemblers. These are Lego-style assembly jobs. And you know, don't underestimate the extent of you know, the poor working conditions, slave labor, prisoner labor, some of the things that go into this. Okay. But American companies are getting the wake-up call, they're getting the message, and what they're doing, this is a very big deal, they're moving the supply chain origin to Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and these are 10-year decisions. You don't, move your, you don't move your factory from China to Vietnam and then move it back next year if things are good. You keep it there. They, again, this, these are major fixed assets, major long-term investments. So if you move it out, you're not coming back, maybe, uh, maybe ever. And so, so these are permanent losses of jobs to China. Um, and their, um, their GDP is uh, uh, overstated, grossly overstated. My adjustment gets them down from, you know, round numbers from about 6.2% to maybe, you know, a little under 4, 3.8 or so. But I've seen other scholars whose opinion I respect say it's more like 2.5% and some say zero. Okay. So China is, uh, the, the growth slowdown is uh, abrupt. Uh, it's material and it's getting worse. And um, so what'll happen is Xi's status is now at risk. I mean, okay, he may be president for life and Xi thought and all that. He may be the most powerful leader since Mao, but um, you know, the cultural revolution got a little bit out of control for Mao too. And so the Politburo, they gotta be careful, but they may, get rid of Xi at some point. Or you may see social unrest, you may see Hong Kong writ large. And Hong Kong's not going away. That situation's not getting better. Ch well, first of all, China will invade. They kind of already have. They haven't sent in the People's Liberation Army, but they have an armed paramilitary police force. They're already in there. 
and they'll do more. The violence will get worse. The social unrest will get worse. And I've been, to, you know, I've been gone to Hong Kong for, uh, you know, 35 years or more. It, it's interesting. If you had asked me in the early 80s, and, and you know, when I first started going to Hong Kong, you know, just describe Hong Kong, I would say, I would have said, well, it's the second most vibrant city in the world after New York. New York would always be number one, but you know, nightlife, energy, finance, attitude, everything about Hong Kong was just, you know, yeah. amazing. Every time I went back there, and I was there um, last year, it got worse. It got more subdued, people got more depressed. And then in the 2000s, I could really detect the funk. It's like, yeah, we're here, we're working, we're a financial center, but this is no fun. And, uh, you know, we're kind of looking over our, our, our backs. And last time I was in Hong Kong, um, I was giving a speech very high level. The Asian Society was hosting it. Um, and uh, somebody took me aside and said, uh, Jim, be careful what you say. And I had never heard that before. Not in Hong Kong. I mean, you might have, someone might have said that in Beijing or Moscow or someplace, but not in Hong Kong. So and I, I said what I wanted anyway. I was getting out the next day, but um, it, it's bad. Well, it, it's obviously bad because there are violent demonstrations and uh, uh, people are, uh, a few people have died and more may die, but that's going to get worse. That genie's out of the bottle. Okay. So my forecast, you know, I, I do update them, but the, but big picture, it goes as follows. So what is j Powell doing? First of all, March 1st, 2022, the Fed fund policy rate, interest rates were zero. And we're now at four and a half percent. Even in the Volcker days, we never went up four and a half percent in 10 months. Not that fast. And so here we are. So what is Powell doing? Well, he's given five speeches on the subject. I don't know why Wall Street doesn't listen, but he keeps trying. He said the same thing every time. He said, inflation is job one. We're just going after inflation. You know, believe us. Um, there is going to be a recession. Unemployment is going to go up. There's going to be pain. I, you know, I've never heard a Fed chairman use the word pain. He used it five times in one paragraph in the Jackson Hole speech, um, and that's what we're doing. And 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 believe us when we say it. According to Jim Rickards, a global recession is coming, and it's going to be painful. Unemployment will go up. The economy is slowing down, and the Federal Reserve has already used every single tool that they have. Inflation has come down, but for a really bad reason. We will get into the reason later in the video. There's the myth of something called the terminal rate. Simply put, it's a rate that the Federal Reserve needs to reach so that inflation will come down on its own without further rate hikes. Wall Street said the Fed is already at the terminal rate, so they don't need to raise it anymore. But the Fed is saying, no, we haven't reached the terminal rate yet, so we have to keep raising it until we reach the 2% inflation target. So the question is, how long will the Fed keep raising the interest rates? We're already over 5% now, and the Fed's still planning to raise it even more? With the current high interest rate, these tech companies already laying off a lot of their employees because they have to tighten their finances. What if the Fed raises it even more? Let's find out. Now, how long will he raise rates? How quickly? And, and what's he trying to do? Powell is trying to get to something that he calls the terminal rate. But the definition of the terminal rate is it's a rate that's high enough to cause inflation to come down on its own without further hikes. So uh, we'll get to a level, and then inflation is coming down, by the way. And uh, in the last five months, it's gone from in the U.S., it's gone from about 9% to 8.7, 8.2, 7.4, 7.1. So it is coming down. Having said that, the target is 2%, and 7.1 is still a far cry from 2. So he's, he's not there, but he's making progress. So here's the, I hate to use the word conundrum, but it kind of is. Wall Street's saying, you're done. You, you, you did it. Mission accomplished. Inflation is coming down. You got what you want to give it time. Stop raising rates. You're going to kill the economy. But the Fed is saying, well, we actually don't know. We can't untangle it. Yes, inflation is coming down. That's objective. But is it coming down because we're still raising rates? Or is it coming down because we're at the terminal rate? Those are two different things. Right now, and this is what Powell's been saying, the Fed leans to the view that they're not at the terminal rate, that inflation is coming down because they're raising rates. They have not achieved the terminal rate. So Powell and the Fed have said, yeah, inflation is coming down, but it's because we're raising rates, not because we're at the terminal rate. We're going to get to the terminal rate, probably two more hikes, and then we'll pause. Um, and then, And then if we're right... We'll just let inflation come down on its own. And that may take a year. So all the stuff about the Fed pivot and cutting rates and all that stuff. I mean, the Fed's thinking mid-2024 before they do that. Now, Wall Street are saying, no, 
you're not going to get that far. You may be at the terminal rate already. You're definitely cause a re- going to cause a recession. It'll be more severe than you think. Uh, and rates are going to have to come down sooner than uh, uh, sooner than people expect. In other words, you've already achieved the terminal rate. You just don't know it. Uh, and you'll probably be the last to know. So with Wall Street, with the cheerleaders, you know, sending that message, but with some serious market indicators, including yield curves, sending that message, why why is Powell sticking to the game plan as I described it? And the answer goes back to uh, 1980, believe it or not, and what's called the Volcker mistake. Jim Rickards said something about the Volcker mistake and why Jerome Powell is still raising the interest rate and not cutting it yet. The famous Fed pivot, as Wall Street calls it. Jay Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake by cutting the interest rates too early and failing to bring inflation down. Do you know why the interest rate was raised to 20% back in the 1980s? It's because of the Volcker mistake. The tale goes as follows. In the late 1970s, inflation was going up a lot and therefore the interest rates rose from around 4.5% to 10%. But that 5% raise took three years, from 1976 to 1979. Meanwhile, the current rate hike that we have now is the fastest in history. We went from zero to five and a quarter percent in just one year. Back in the 80s, we had a recession, and the chairman of the Fed, Paul Volcker, had to cut the interest rate down by 7%. Not 0.7%, but seven full percentage points. He cut the interest rate from 17% to around 10%. And after that pivot, he raised it back to 20%. And three years later, in 1987, the rates finally came back to normal. Back then, we needed 10 years in order to finally win the inflation fight. And now what? We're expecting it to win in a couple of months? The Fed just raised the rates fastest in history and people expect to bring it back down? Let's get into the detail. People forget that there was a recession in 1980. It was sharp but quick. It was over very quickly. It had nothing to do with monetary policy. The Carter administration issued some dopey regulation on a ceiling on credit card interest rates. And the industry said, fine, we're just not going to lend anybody any money. The economy fell instantly, kind of like a smaller version of what happened in 2020 with the with the uh, pandemic panic. Uh, and then they said, oh, sorry, just kidding. And then they took the ceiling off and then things got back to, to normal. Now, this was a time when farmers around the country were driving front loaders and tractors to Washington and they were circling the Fed building. And one guy drove his tractor up the steps of the Fed and he and Volcker was being burned in effigy. That I mean, that all happened. So uh, it was a little bit of pressure. And of course, Congress was up in arms and the White House was up in arms. So Volcker, uh, not quite panicked, but he cut interest rates seven percentage points, not, not 0.7, seven full percentage points to deal with the recession, which number one was unnecessary because the recession was caused by a policy blunder from the White House, which was quickly corrected. And number two, he had not won the fight against inflation. Well, after he cut rates and we came out of that very quick sort of snap recession, inflation got even worse. And that's when Volcker had to raise rates to 20%. And Volcker, in hindsight, and he said this in his last book, just before he died, um, he said, "We, we shouldn't have done that. We should have stuck to our inflation mission. So now Powell, remember Powell's not an economist, he's a lawyer. So he kind of thinks like a lawyer. I can relate to that, you know, looking at both sides. Powell does not want to be that guy. He does not want to be the guy who balks early and cuts rates, the famous Wall Street pivot, before the battle against inflation is won. Because the outcome could be exactly what Volcker experienced, which is inflation wasn't done, doesn't go away, comes back stronger. And then you do have to destroy the economy as we did in 1981-82. That was the worst recession. That was far worse than the little one in 1980. That was the worst since the Great Depression. We've managed to break that record several times since then, but at the time that was horrific. But but Volcker and others have said that was a blunder he never should have done. So Powell does not want to give up the rate hikes too early because he does not want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He does not want to be that guy. And that's what's driving him, even as Wall Street screams, you're already there. So, so the question, so that's the lay of the land. Those are, those are the two competing sides. How does this play out? We learned a lot from Jim about the current situation and what Jerome Powell will be doing. But there's more to that story. Powell doesn't even understand what's going on in the real world, which is inflation itself. There are two sources of inflation, the supply side and the demand side. We are at the supply side inflation, which means the supply of goods is scarce, but the demand is high and therefore the prices go up. But supply-side inflation can transform into demand-side inflation, and this is where the dangers begin. 
People's spinning behavior changes and they're worried that something worse will happen and then they grab everything they can and therefore the demand rises and you got yourself inflation caused by an increase in the demand side. That's what most people don't understand, including Wall Street. Wall Street said inflation will come down on its own because we've reached the terminal rate. But Jerome Powell thinks we are not done yet and therefore he will raise rates even more. And what does Jim Rickards think? Does he think Powell is at the terminal rate yet? In my view, Powell probably is there. He probably is at something like a terminal rate. He probably doesn't have to raise interest rates anymore. He doesn't believe that himself. His models tell him otherwise because they're relying on the Phillips curve, which is junk science. I mean, the last time I looked at a Phillips curve, it was flat. At least where I went to school, curve was curved. This, this thing is flat. There is no correlation between unemployment and inflation. There just isn't. But the Fed thinks there is. So I always tell people, don't... Um, if you want to forecast Fed policy and understand the Fed, don't think like a rational person. You have to think like the Fed because you have to get inside their heads or else you're going to get it wrong. So they're looking at unemployment, which is the lowest. The unemployment rate is the lowest since 1969. Well, if you believe in the Phillips curve, then that's a sure sign of inflation. As I say, even though it's coming down, it's still pretty high. So they, they think they have to keep fighting this fight. But here's here's what they're missing. Here's where it all falls down. Yeah, inflation as measured, CPI, PPI, you know, uh, personal consumption expenditure, core, non-core, year over year. There are like 20 different ways to measure it. Uh, it is it is coming down. But there are two sources of inflation. And it's going to sound obvious, but you got to separate them, the supply side and the demand side. They both result in price increases, but they have completely different dynamics. Supply side inflation is what we're seeing. It's what we saw in 1974 with the Arab oil embargo during the Arab-Israeli war when they cut us off from oil. And, you know, you had to line up for gasoline. I lived through that. Uh, you know, bare shelves and you couldn't get uh, certain things. It, was, it wasn't that every supermarket shelf was bare the way it was in East Germany in the 1950s. But something was always missing. And that's still the case today. So, of course, prices went up and, uh, you know, people were trying to pay whatever they had to to get what they needed. And energy prices were a big driver of that. So that feeds through as a form of inflation. The other kind of inflation is from the demand side. So the supply side is called um, a cost push. Costs go up and they push it onto the consumers. The other kind is from the demand side. It's called demand pull. Uh, and basically, consumers have a change in mentality. They're worried about inflation. They would say, hey, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. Gee, I better go buy it today because if I wait for six months, the price is going to go up uh, or apply that to anything, a new dress, new suit of clothes, whatever. Um, and so you're pulling demand forward and it's behavioral. And that will also drive prices up. But they're very different things. Now, cost push can morph into demand pull. That's what happened in the 70s. It started from the supply side. But by the late 70s, 80s, and Volcker, which we've just been talking about, it had tipped over into the demand side. That hasn't happened yet. We've had the supply side inflation, the cost push. It hasn't yet tipped into demand pull. It hasn't really affected consumer behavior that much in terms of uh, people anticipating more inflation. It could, but it hasn't happened yet. Here's why that's an important distinction. Cost push inflation negates itself. You know, the old saying that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices because people can't afford it. Like, you know, maybe if demand is inelastic, if you got to fill up your Ford F-150 truck with gasoline to take the kids to school or go to work. But if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gas because you're not leaving the house. So, so it tends to negate itself, whereas demand pull feeds on itself. Powell has not made that distinction. And if, if, if I'm right, I think I am right, and the evidence backs that up, this inflation will come down, not because the Fed is raising interest rates, but because higher prices destroy demand all on their own. If I have to, if I used to pay $75 to fill up my tr truck with gas, and now I have to pay $150, which is about right, I'll do it because I got to get to work. But that's $75 I, I'm not going to spend on something else. I'm not going to go out for dinner. I'm not going to go to a show, a concert, or you know, buy a... Um, you know, a, a new, uh, uh, you know, a new camera, whatever, whatever it might be. So it it does tend to depress um, demand, destroy demand, and hurt the economy. And then it slows down, and then the inflation comes down on its own. That appears to be happening, but Powell hasn't really made the distinction. He's still he's fighting the last war. I had to use a cliche, but he's fighting the Volcker War. And what he's got looks a little bit more like the Herbert Hoover War. That looks a little bit more like the 1930s than the 1970s. So the bottom line on all this is the Fed is going to raise rates at least twice more. 
for the reasons I mentioned. Powell doesn't want to repeat the Volcker mistake. He thinks the battle is not won. He has to get to the terminal rate. In reality, he's probably already there if there is such a thing as a terminal rate. It's another one of these things they made up. Um, uh, inflation is coming down and so will probably continue, but for really bad reasons. There were a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. These are mortgages that, you know, no documentation, don't have to prove your income, very non-credit worthy. But there was a there was a bubble mentality, a frenzy, and everyone, hey, buy a house and borrow money, fix it up, sell it for twice as much, walk away rich, you know, and everybody was doing it. Mortgage default rates rarely get above 5%. 5% is really high in the mortgage market. So people were saying, you know, smart people like Ben Stein, the financial analyst, but, but the central bank and others were like, well, okay, let's get crazy. Let's assume a 20% default rate, which is which ne has never happened, but just assume that's true. On a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages, a 20% default rate would be a $200 billion loss, which was only slightly higher than the SNL crisis of the 1980s, you know, adjusted for inflation, it would have been a comparable loss. And the attitude was, well, we survived the 80s, we'll survive this. Yeah, it's bad, banks will take losses, stock prices go down a little bit, but we'll survive. What they missed is, yes, there was $1 trillion of uh, subprime mortgages, but there were $6 trillion of derivatives. Yeah. That was invisible. So all of a sudden, 20% of that was $1.2 trillion. So you, you create derivatives out of thin air, yeah. Uh, and there's no limit on how many you can have. They're off balance sheet, meaning give me the balance sheet of the company, I won't see them. You have to read the footnotes and then the, the information behind the footnotes. So non-transparent, unregulated, no limit on size. So the, the crisis was actually much worse than anyone realized. And then when it started to collapse, the, the, the contagion spread throughout the financial system. My point about 2008, it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998 and we flew right into 2008. But once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008, and we're going to fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, the point is each crisis is bigger than the one before. The uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts. And are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, okay, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com complexity theory and capital markets, how that works, but where's the crisis coming from? What's gonna be the catalyst? It's actually a long list. Now, student loans, there are $1.6 trillion worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis, you know, how, does the, how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into to debt and deficits. Uh, so when um, you know a lender, credit union, or anybody, or university makes a loan to a student, and the treasury uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults, um, and the credit union, the lender, simply turns to the treasury and said, here's, here's your loan file, pay me. And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. Uh, now it's on the Treasury. But until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the Treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know, trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all. I can describe them. I can see how they're going to converge into, into a worse crisis. But in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why, but why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates of, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talk about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York. 
but she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt is there relative to the size of the economy? The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio, but mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade. How much debt divided by the size of the economy? So in a simple example, if you had uh, $5 trillion of debt and a $10 trillion economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or 50%. Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yeah. That ratio is over 100%. We have round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105%, highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%, 200%. 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If you go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory. And he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Ber Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so. You proved that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation, without causing high interest rates, without causing a run on the bank. So all we're saying is, you know, you did it to prop up Jamie Dimon's bonus. We wanted to do it to forgive student loans. We may have, we may have different policy objectives, but the process is the same. What's the problem? Now, of all the things I've debated, I've, for years I was de dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin, I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio, and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and the, the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory, you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand. And I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, I'll buy a new car, buy a house, get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities. I no longer trust the Congress. Uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up. And the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold. There, as I say, land, real estate, um, and natural resources, they're all, good, uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The, the, you know, the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly. And that's the problem with the theory. But the Fed has a hidden asset. In a surprising revelation, Jim Rickards talks about the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. He unveiled a hidden asset, gold certificates dating back to 1934. These certificates were issued to compensate the Fed when the U.S. Treasury confiscated its gold, a move that is believed to have legal complexities under the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The certificates, valued at the fixed rate of $42.22 per ounce on the Fed's balance sheet, were originally meant to represent the historical cost of the confiscated gold. However, the intriguing twist emerges when considering the potential revaluation of these gold certificates to reflect the current market price of gold, 
which hovers around $1,850 per ounce. If the certificates were marked to market, it could reveal a hidden asset on the Fed's books worth approximately $350 billion. This unexpected revelation adds an interesting dimension to the ongoing debates about the Fed's solvency and financial stability. The implications of such a revaluation extend beyond the immediate financial adjustments. It could revive discussions about the gold standard, a monetary system where a country's currency is directly tied to a specific quantity of gold. This potential move could be seen as acknowledging the true value of gold and its role in backing the country's currency. Jim Rickard speculates on how the gold price might react to such a revaluation, positing it as a significant event that could attract attention and prompt a surge in interest and investment in gold. Furthermore, the potential move could be perceived as the Fed indirectly reverting to a gold standard. With Jim Rickards estimating that a conservative 40% backing of M1 money supply would necessitate a gold price of around $15,000 per ounce. In essence, the idea of marking the gold certificates to market on the Fed's balance sheet is presented as a complex and potentially transformative event that could have far-reaching consequences. Sparking debates about the role of gold in the modern monetary system and the potential impact on the economy. Um, if you go again to go to the balance sheet, go to the uh, the asset side, the first line item, there's something called gold certificate. And what is that? Well, in 1934, the uh, U.S. Treasury confiscated the Fed's gold. They had already taken the gold from U.S. citizens by that point, uh, but they wanted it all, and so they took the Fed's gold. But under the fifth and but. Again, bearing in mind the Fed's privately owned. So under the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, it is illegal, it is unconstitutional to seize property without paying just compensation. You can do it, but you, you got to pay the person. And then people get into all kinds of arguments about what it's actually worth. So what just compensation did the Treasury give to the Fed when they took the Fed's gold in 1934? The answer is they gave them a gold certificate. It can be, uh, you can calculate it. In other words, you can say, well, what is the amount of, gold by weight, not by dollar value, but by weight that is needed to back up that certificate given the historic cost. Well, the answer is about 8,000 tons. Guess how much gold the treasury has? About 8,000 tons. I mean, one of the reasons I've um, uh, hypothesized that the treasury stopped selling gold in 1980 because they sold, they lost gold to trading partners between 1950 and 1970. They lost uh, 11,000 tons. Down, they went from 20 to nine, but they sold another thousand tons in the 1970s to suppress the price of gold, which failed because it always does. Um, so, but by 1980, they had kind of were down to 8,000 tons, and they stopped. Why did the U.S. stop selling gold? We've never sold any significant amount of gold since. The answer is, in my view, is that that. They can't go below that because that's the amount of gold the Treasury needs to back up this gold certificate on the Fed's books. So, okay, just kind of put that in to one side. That asset is valued on the Fed's balance sheet of $42.22 an ounce. The price of gold, you know, look today, it was about $1,850 an ounce. Now, so, you know, what's, as I say, sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If we're going to mark the mortgages to market, in a world where interest rates have gone up and the mortgages have gone down, it's only fair to mark the gold to market. And if you mark that gold to market at $1,850 an ounce versus $42, voila, you would find that the Fed has another approximately $350 billion of hidden assets. So that takes care, I think that takes care of the solvency problem. So before we beat up the Fed on mark to market on mortgages, that's fine, but have a look at the gold and realize that they have a hidden asset, a uh, shadow asset on their books that's worth in the hundreds of billions of dollars. What do you think it would do to the gold price if they did revalue uh, mark to market their gold holdings? Do you think that would create a lot of attention for gold and, and people would pile in or do you think it would just be an accounting change that no one really notices? Uh, I think it would be a very big deal. Um, but it begs the question, uh, if you're going to revalue it, to what level do you revalue it? So I would say, well, the market's 1850. You know, that's about where it is today. It goes up and down, but so we value it at 1850. Um, that uh, could be highly deflationary. And the reason is um, you, in effect, you're admitting, you're putting yourself on a gold standard. You don't have to. Uh, that's why they won't do it. Uh, they don't want to touch it, but if you did, you would be saying, hey, gold's really worth 1850 and we have this much gold, et cetera. 
But at that point, um, analysts would sort of turn and say, well, okay, well, you're back to a kind of gold standard. Uh, what's the relationship between gold and money yeah. and, or, or um, uh, currency or you know, US oh. dollars and others, the money supply. But it, what is the relationship between gold and money supply? What you would find is that at 1850, uh, the gold relative to the money supply is about 2%. Whereas uh, historic gold standards were run with somewhere between 20 and 40%. Uh, Bank of England in the 19th century managed a successful gold standard between the Congress of Vienna and World War I with about 20% gold. In the US, through most of the 20th century, at least the first half, ran a gold standard with about 40% backing. It was actually the law. Um, the law until uh, the late 1960s, late 1968, was that the Fed. Uh, Fed money supply, base money, could not be more than uh, two and a half times the value of gold. Um, originally at twenty dollars an ounce, twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents an ounce. Later, thirty-five dollars an ounce. But whatever that number was, um, times the amount of gold that 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 that, that was uh, that had to be forty percent of the money supply, and the money supply could not be greater than that. And then they got rid of that in nineteen sixty-eight because of the war in Vietnam. But um, but the, but the point being. 20% has worked, 40% definitely works. Uh, the Austrians like to bang the table and insist on 100%, but you know, maybe, but that's uh, historically not been required. You just need enough gold to be able to give gold to people who want it when they want it. And, and if you're credible in that dimension, most people are content to hold the money. So as a hypothetical, you can say, well, okay, let's say we want a gold standard and let's say that we want 40% backing of M1. Um, M2 is a bigger number, or at least it can be. Uh, let's just say, for, so 40% backing of M1, that's a, uh, uh, a conservative kind of gold standard, not extreme, but reasonable. What would the, given the amount of gold the United States have, has, what would the price of gold have to be in order to maintain that ratio? The answer is about $15,000 an ounce. And people say, well, Jim, you used to say $10,000 an ounce. Well, that's true because it was true at the time. But when you expand the money supply, the number goes up, right? Because the amount of gold is fixed. So uh, yeah, it was 10,000 uh, not that many years ago. And today it's 15,000. Well, if you if you say gold is worth 1,800, people are going to say, well, give me the gold. I'll take all the gold you got at that price. Uh, and then they're going to have to shut the gold window again, and that has its own problems. But in other words, you would be, it's, it's not clear how it would work. I mean, there are a lot of ways it could work mechanically. It's not clear what the government would actually do. But my point is, when you, if you try to mark gold to market on the Fed's balance sheet, you're opening Pandora's box. Because you are, you would be getting a lot of people, bankers, analysts, Wall Streeters, investors to sit up and take notice and say, well, hey, what is going on here? You know, you're back in the gold business. Well, you got the price wrong because uh, you can't back up your money supply at that level. And the truth is you can't.